morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here again with Frank Clifford. We did make an interview last year about Jupiter. And this time around, we will be speaking about the meeting chart. So welcome back on my channel. It's a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you, Victor. How it's great you? to have you. Yeah, I'm I'm great. Thank you. I am struggling with Internet, so I hope that this uh, meeting doesn't uh, end abruptly. But uh, apart from that, life is good and I'm busy and, uh, you know, I'm as busy as the planets would suggest because there's a lot happening. What have you in been up to? Yeah. What have you um, been up I've to been, or what has your I've, school been up to? Well, I've been been working on uh, different areas of astrology. I've been teaching on electional astrology, on horary, uh, and um, the usual one hundred and one fabulous things that we learn when we're learning astrology. I've been having you know, it's always great fun. I love teaching. I'm sure you love teaching, and uh, you. I always say you learn uh, you learn more by teaching, and so I use those exercises as opportunities to just keep keep learning and keep. Um, Keep under, keep honing my craft. Yeah, absolutely. I love teaching, and uh, that's when I learn the most as well. So, absolutely. Before we jump into the uh, talk about the meeting chart, uh, two announcements I would like to make. Uh, I'm sure everyone heard about um, the devastating uh, earthquake in Turkey. So, I've decided to hold a donation-based webinar about the astrology of pregnancy. That's going to be taking place on the 26th of uh, February. And then if you wish to sign up, please go ahead, go on my website and donate as much as you can. If you cannot, no problem. You can still sign up. It's free of charge. But please share the link with others in case someone else will be able to help. And uh, today we have chosen the topic of the meeting chart because it can really reveal great stuff about what to expect maybe later on in the relationship or from the date you are going on and so forth. So that's what Frank is going to be talking about. And I think it's a great opportunity to mention that I will be holding a retreat, five days uh, astrology retreat, all about relationship and one day family constellation therapy when we are going to be clearing your blockages as well. So if you are interested, the link will be in the description box. But without any further ado, Frank, what do you have got to share with us oh. about a meeting chart? Thanks, Victor. Well, I love the first meeting chart. When people look at uh, compatibility in astrology, they often look at uh, the aspects between two charts, which are very relevant, very informative. Uh, but they also do a um, composite, which is a... Uh, as you know, a midpoint of two charts. It's the coming together of two charts to create a third chart. And that can be very revealing because it's a uh, a construct explaining things. And then there's also the Davison chart, which is the midpoint in time and space. So, you know, uh, whatever relationship you're looking at, colleagues, friends, lovers, uh, it could end up being in the middle of the ocean somewhere at a date that that uh, that's the midpoint of two births. So there are lots of ways of of working with compatibility. But I ask if um, you use any of those, like Synastry yeah. Composite or Davison. I I teach them. Um, whether I don't really use them that much uh, on a personal level or with my clients. What I tend to do is, apart from the first meeting chart, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, I tend to look at uh, just inter aspects. You know, your Venus square my Mars or my Moon opposite your Sun. Um, but when clients come to see me, one of the first things I I say is, you know, we can look at another person's chart with permission. We can take a look at that. We can explore it with their permission. But you'll get a lot more out of the session if we explore you and your chart because you know yourself better. And I think sometimes clients come or students want to sort of look at the other person when in in quite in all honesty, I think you learn so much more from studying your own behavior, your own reactions, what you project, uh, 101 things to do with yourself. Maybe that sounds like an Aries talking, you know, it's all about me. <laughs> um, but it's um, it's one of those um, areas where if you start with yourself, the better you understand yourself, the better the decisions you make for yourself. And you also attract better people, as we know. You know, you, you start to value yourself and appreciate yourself. 
the people that you would have given time to a year or two ago, you they just fall away. They're, they're no longer there as, um, as lessons. We have new lessons to learn always, but when we start to treat ourselves better, we learn to select people and we learn to teach other people how to treat us better. So um, the study of yourself through astrology or whatever means to me is always the beginning. Um, so that's what I tend to look at primarily. Yeah. One of my issues nowadays is that I think uh, synastry is a little bit uh, over mystified. What I mean by that is that people look at it. Recently, I had a client and they had a Saturn Sun conjunction in the synastry chart. And they had only been together for two weeks. So her question was, shall I just leave this guy because this is never going to work out? And I was like, oh, my days, where did you get that from? Oh, well, I read it. And many people said it on uh, astrological groups that, you know, this is very difficult and it's going to be a challenge. And what boils my blood is that people are giving advice such as we'll never go out with a guy because their Saturn is conjuncting your son. I, I Personally, I do believe that the synastry is an initial chemistry and maybe the first three to six months, I usually describe that way to my clients and students. And then after a while, the composite chart for me takes over and then that's going to show events. Uh, and maybe with the Saturn Sun conjunction, you know, maybe we start a little bit on a rocky road. But if we solidify that relationship and there is no ego fight and and, you know, then I think that actually is a commitment aspect as well. But no one really seems to be mentioning it. So, yeah, um, that's all. I just wanted to share there yeah. that uh, we don't need to be afraid of aspects. We just need to integrate them in the best possible way. That's right. And whatever the aspect is, whatever the placement, whatever the challenge, um, every relationship presents challenges. Everybody brings something new into our lives. And whether a relationship lasts two weeks or 20 years, it's not. there's never really a failure if we understand something about ourselves and about other people through relationship. So I'm open, I'm all for try every aspect. You know, if you go back and look at the charts of people you've dated, people you've hated, uh, people, you know, on television that you love, just look at synastry generally, you'll see what they reflect in you and how you can learn from that. So I wouldn't be afraid of any aspect. I think, um, uh, if you start reading that from anywhere, you realize the the person writing it is coming from a very narrow, um, literal point of view sometimes. Like, you know, Saturn is about delays and restrictions or, or burdens, but it's also, as you say, about commitment and maturity. And if we get involved with somebody with strong Saturn links to our chart or vice versa, it's probably an invitation to mature. It's an invitation to look at things in the long term, to take responsibility rather than, oh, it's going to be painful. Well, yeah, anything that's meaningful in relationship has an element of pain attached to it, just simply because uh, life can be painful and we get upset and feelings get in the way, ego gets in the way, 101 things can can reflect uh, pain and difficulty and joy and enjoyment and I think what people want sometimes when they begin relationships looking at charts is they want some sort of assurance. And you never know, first of all, what that person, the level somebody's operating on. You know, you may meet somebody with um, <clears throat> strong Jupiter. They love to travel. Another person with strong Jupiter in their chart or uh, Jupiter links, um, it's not about the travel, it's the mental, philosophical, or it could be religious in someone else. Um, or you're meeting somebody who's never really looked at themselves. And the synastry looks wonderful, but you're dealing with somebody who really hasn't explored who they are yet. Uh, so you never know what level somebody is operating on or what they choose to operate on. And I don't mean higher or lower. I just mean different zones, different levels. And so, uh, you know, it's if somebody wants to be in a relationship and they're with somebody who also wants to be in a relationship, that's the intention we need. 
What we don't want is to try and persuade somebody to be in a relationship or long for somebody to change their mind or because you want, like anything, you want a two-way reaction of some kind. That's intention. So we spend a lot of time, I see this a lot with relationships in my own life and in other people's, where we're staring at one person who's staring at somebody else, and then we might have somebody staring at us, and we're never look, both looking at each other at the same time. And so um, the, the, the key, I think, is intention at the beginning. Find somebody who's willing to want to explore with you. It doesn't have to be long term. It doesn't have to be major psychological growth. All it has to be is, I want to engage with you for a while. And I want to explore. And that's a great start. It's not everything, but it's a great start. So I think people come in expecting or wanting too many assurances. Tell me this is going to last. Tell me this is going to be important. I have a lot of um, Indian clients clients from India living in England or, or living elsewhere. And um, they often, they've learned about the system of 36 points. And in, in Vedic astrology with synastry, they mark it out of 36. <clears throat> and I've never thought about marking anybody out of 36 in whatever capacity, but that's how they do it. And they'll say, well, I got a 32 from this astrologer, but only in 18, what do you think? And I say, I don't speak in terms of numbers, but we can talk about what it is that you need and possibly what it is that your potential partner might need, et cetera. So um, reducing something down to good or bad or numbers uh, feels like a, uh, like a um, a reductionist approach, which of course it is, yeah. You know, I mean, on one hand, I do understand because I think we live in a factual world at the moment. And obviously kind of Neptune hasn't been integrated properly in our lives yet where we're going to be trusting the universe that it has got our back. And obviously the numbers, if we just think about the companies and so forth, they are only interested in the numbers as well. And that's what we do, humankind also. But, you know, I do love using um, exalted rulers. And uh, and one of my favorite one in that sense is Libra, because Libra's exalted ruler is Saturn. And I usually describe the exaltation as, as an ecstasy point. So... Meaning that if we put the hard work into the relationship and kind of like crystallizing the basics and so forth, then we have got a beautiful relationship ahead of us. Uh, but of course, when we are not willing to work and probably we are a little bit egotistical and we are not paying attention to other people's needs, then the relationship starts crumbling and falling apart. And obviously our needs and the partner's needs are not met. So I think that's the reason why Saturn is exalted in the sign of Libra, because a relationship is a hard work, like, definitely. But anyway, so how do we set up a meeting chart? Right. So we need to think back to when we met somebody. Now, there's nowadays we often meet people online. It's a swipe left or swipe right. I'm not sure which. Um, but there are different ways of meeting. So um, if you, the thing to is go back to the date that you met somebody. Uh, somebody important in your life, it can be somebody still in your life, uh, etc. It can be anybody um, that you want to study and try and narrow down the time and the place. The date and the place, uh, the date and the place are usually the easiest ones, of course. The time can be a bit iffy. Was it eight o'clock at night? Was it six? Whatever. Sometimes an email might confirm that. There's some research you can do. But we need to calculate the first meeting chart for uh, the moment of the first connection. Now, whether that connection is uh, in person or on Skype, on Zoom, online, is a matter of argument these days, because a lot of people meet and some people never meet in person. We might have people on the other side of the world that we connect to. And therefore, I would do a chart for the first moment. Uh, from your perspective, if you're the astrologer, from your location, if you're if the other person's in another country, um, just do a chart for the moment that you began chatting and really face to face. Now, in the old days, I would say it's the first handshake, the first hug, the first physical connection. Yeah. Um, so I, I prefer that. But of course, these days, a lot of people get to know each other for quite some time 
online before they ever meet. Um, if it's a swipe, you can do a chart for that. But my feeling is probably the first intention. Let's let's meet up. Let's have a chat. Um, you you like me, I like you. Why don't we look at the first text, but then look at the first face to face where you get a chance to see each other, if you know that. So you might have one or two first meeting charts. One of the first um, technical connection uh, through the text, um, another one for the first face-to-face uh, -face online and the other one for the first face-to-face -face in person. Um, and I would say, look at all three to see what you feel would be the most meaningful time. Now, um, uh, you know, I've had I've met people online and then you meet them in person. Um, it all depends on whether you feel like this is the first moment or not. So when you've got a choice, you have to, I would do all three or all two, depending on them, and then just watch them and study them for a little while to see how they reflect. Uh, but generally, I would prefer uh, the first in-person hug, kiss, handshake, meeting, that sort of thing, if I had the choice. But we live in a very different world now from the first time I dated uh, some years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I personally, I also use the first kind of handshake chart because uh, personally speaking, uh, if I'm talking someone online, talking to someone online, they tend to be saying I'm very funny and all those type of things. But when we are meeting, they see a very serious side of me. Obviously, a mask is, you know, it's more difficult to take off that mask in person than online or via text messages and so forth. And um uh, Often, you know, um, they just see a different side of the person. So I agree, good to look at both of the charts, for example. But I like the handshake one. Yes. So what energy. would be the key? What would be the key principles of interpreting a meeting chart? Well, um, it's very similar to a regular chart, except that the meeting chart is a energy in itself. So we, when we look at the moon in a natal chart, it's the person's major needs, the things that we need to feel uh, to feel loved, that we have, need to have in our lives. I call the moon the backpack, the things that we carry around us uh, that feel um, are, are the essential needs, whatever they may be. Um, in a relationship chart, the moon speaks of the emotional environment created by the couple. Now, it may be a business environment, but it's still a working daily feeling environment. Do you feel safe? Do you feel protected? Do you feel um, adventurous or maybe more conservative? This will depend on what the moon is, uh, where the moon is by sign and house and aspect in the um, in the first meeting chart. It's also like the emotional pulse. Uh, I would say it's like um, not just the primary need, but it's everything from the expressed emotions to the unexpressed ones. Um, if couples come together and they have uh, trust issues, I think the first meeting chart moon will reflect the trust issues. Uh, and it will, it will reflect that. Do I feel comfortable in my own skin? You know, when we live with somebody, it's so different from dating. It's so different from being at work with somebody. They see you at your worst, your groggiest, your smelliest, your everything, you know, all the bad habits and everything. Um, so the moon is, I think, the most essential planet uh, when looking at synastry, because it really speaks to me of all the stuff that when you, you know, behind closed doors, it's the hidden agenda. You know, we might meet people with our ascendant and our first house um, and connect with them when they come home with us and they get to feel our space and they get to relax and they might stay for a few nights, whatever, whatever the relationship, whatever the situation, they'll meet our moon and they'll meet that. And some moons just feel foreign to us. Some feel threatening. Other people feel like, oh, I could stay here forever. Uh, so um, the moon is essential in our natal charts, but the first meeting chart will also say what's the primary emotional need here or the trust issue or the safety issue as well. So that's one of the first things I'd look at. What about you? Um, I tend to be starting with the rising sign and uh, looking at maybe what type of circumstances they the, the, the two people have met or 
the ruler might show whether it was an ideal environment or not so much. Or I tend to be looking at actually the first and the seventh house ruler, they have got some type of reception between them, each other, as well as maybe aspects. Maybe I should share a chart and then um, we can kind of walk that Please through. Do. Um, oh, not that one. So I met someone last year in January. Uh, basically what okay. happened was that um, I love traveling and um, I went to Cyprus and I lived there for a little while, but I found it extremely boring. So one day I just woke up and then I decided, no, I'm going to move to Turkey. So I placed myself on these applications to Turkey to start chatting to people. And... Uh, and then I met this person and we had great conversations. And then I got into a little bit of a trouble because my friend was meant to come and pick up uh, my doggy in Cyprus to bring it to uh, Turkey. Unfortunately, uh, my friend got COVID. So she had to cancel it two days before. And uh, so I was telling this person that I don't know how I'm going to come. And then he offered me to come and pick up the doggy. We, Bearing in mind, we have never met before. So I was kind of biting my nails whether, is he going to turn up? I bought him the ticket. Is he going to turn up? He did turn up. So, but that was the first meeting chart, basically, right. when we met in person. And that's and you were describing about the moon, uh, how important that is. And obviously that falls into the sixth house in the sign of Aquarius. From a traditional yeah. point of view, not the greatest place. So did he turn up did he turn up with the dog as well? No, he to pick up the dog to from, pick up the dog. so that we can go together. Because uh when you travel by dogs, I've got two, one passenger can take only one dog. So I that's uh -huh. why I needed another person to take my other dog on the flight. I oh, I see. So you were yes, you were trusting that uh he'd show up. And so that sounds like a pretty good beginning to a relationship. The trust issue is there with the pet. Um, I love the fact that the chart has such a strong sixth house, which we know, of course, is to do with pets. Um, the moon is the natural ruler of, of small animals and things that we care for, particularly cats and dogs, I think can probably... Um, you know, we think of dogs as being perhaps more friendly than cats. Cats are very independent, aren't they? So uh, maybe we look at, I think of dogs, maybe just if you're thinking of signs here, dogs more Leo. It's like, show me attention and I'll be, you know, stroke me and I'll forever be happy. Uh, even though cats are associated with Leo, I think cats more, uh, I think of them more like Aquarians. You know, I'm just, I'll do my thing. And, you know, you I might share my house with you, says the cat. A very different type of energy. Um, so we've got um, the uh, chart rules. We've got Virgo rising, again, associated with pets. Uh, but it's very early degrees. And my experience of early degrees, as I'm sure you have as well, is that sense of um, just dipping your toe in, just deciding what might suit you, what might fit. Um, so an early degree ascendant in any sort of meeting chart points to uh, usually enthusiasm to analyze, to dissect. Uh, so uh, having a Virgo rising um, uh, first meeting chart probably speaks of the very strong need to feel intellectually connected, that you're analyzing, that you're working things out together, that you both see the world from uh, an intelligent, analytical perspective. Um, have you noticed that with the two of you since? Uh, we are great friends. We have been great friends since. The relationship unfortunately ended after a free month. Um, I ended it uh, personally. Uh, and I think the chart describes it pretty well as well. Uh, on one hand, um, the, it's very interesting that the, we have got a strong sixth house because we met at a hotel. One of the reasons why we met at a hotel was because uh, I was on the Greek side of Cyprus and then the plane goes from the Turkish side. So I had to go on the other side with my dogs and then we stayed one night in a hotel. So six houses in service industry, even though the hotel is more, in my opinion, is a fourth house meta. 
but uh, so we met at at a at a service industry facility type of thing. Um, but um, yes, the communication was extremely difficult for us after a while. Um, yeah, and I think that Mercury ruled rising sign shows that if it doesn't go well, it, it can be the ending of that, or it can be a problem, basically. And Mercury has got a wide conjunction to the Saturn as well there. So I think it shows greatly that uh, communication is a problem. Well, yes, it would. Uh -huh. For me, it would show that um, a lot of attention needs to be paid to it, because if there are differences... And maybe, you know, the key to that chart, with there's a lot of Capricorn, a lot of Aquarius. So Saturn is very dominant in the chart. And so issues of, is this person mature enough? Or am I, are they ready for commitment? Are they ready to, you know, these are going to be question marks over a Saturn type of chart. Mercury um, in Aquarius is also square to Uranus. Uh, and it's approaching, applying, which means it's going to happen in the future for those that don't know about the applying aspect. So in my opinion, that means there's going to be a point where differences of opinion, attitudes that are different to do with freedom, space, friendships, allowing person a space. Um, this is not a chart that would would invite a lot of jealousy into it because it it needs to be independent um self-contained it's like i do my thing i run my business um either don't be jealous of the people i speak to or don't attach yourself you know, do your thing i'll do my thing we'll come together and do a third thing together yeah so it has that um uh question of is somebody mature enough to to look at that to look at what is needed from both of you and it looks like there's the chart is a lot about freedom which is aquarius but if not if it can't be a personal intimate relationship aquarius is always very happy with friendship connecting with somebody on a social level um you know, so it's got I, I guess it's certainly had the potential to be both of what you're experiencing you know, it's interesting because uh, one of my issues with this person was the responsibility and the maturity. Uh, a person without a goal for me is very difficult to accept. So I always have got a plan where I will be in a year time, five years time. And one of the first questions I had was, you know, where do you see yourself in five years time? And then the answer was not pleasing um you know you know so that was one of my issue and interesting to see because I, I kind of you know Saturn rules the fifth house here and then the other big challenge was actually the intimacy department which I wasn't extremely happy with um so I think the chart describes it beautifully that we had issues to go through or something to solve there with that Saturn do you look at the rising sign as the couple itself or do you look at it as you and the seventh house as the partner or how does that work? Well, I was curious about that. I thought, is it, um, does it represent one person or the other? Does it represent two different aspects of the same union? And what I started to recognize was that um, the ascendant often and the ascendant ruler often indicates the person who is the uh, who participates most in the world, the person that is the active one. It's like, um, it, it's it's always Joe and his partner, or he's bringing his partner along, you know? Um, often relationships have that feeling, not in all places, but often it's um, that, that, you know, it's like Joe and Alex rather than Alex and Joe, or Alex is bringing Joe, or there's um, often a feeling the ascendant is the person that tends to offer the social image, the face of the couple a little bit more. And the descendant tends to be more the person that uh, takes a, not always a passive role, but takes a more of a backseat or a supportive role. It's a bit like the sun and the moon in the chart. Uh, the the moon will be the great foundation in many ways. It doesn't mean the weaker or the quieter partner. Um, it just has a different function. So I've been studying that for a while, and I'm still learning, still observing that. Uh, but I, I get to 
feel that the ascendant tends to be the more uh, socially open or extroverted person in the two. Um, and of course, any planets nearby in this chart, you've got, uh, of course, Jupiter bang on the descendant as well. And again, rather than it being, I wouldn't look at this chart in any chart and say it's promising anything. Um, what it's saying is a, a particular energy. Now, the Mercury, Saturn and the Mercury, Uranus contacts say um, the Mercury function, communication, um, uh, ideas, shared dialogue, all those different things are going to be very important. And it's going to be, these are things that are going to be raised early on with that Mercury contacting the, the both, both of them. But the Jupiter on the descendant uh, is interesting because mutable signs, as we know, can take or leave things. They're not signs that necessarily adore the commitment or responsibility for life. Life. Yeah. So we've got the mutable signs of Gemini, Virgo, uh, Sagittarius and Pisces. Virgo less so, but the other three tend to say, hmm, I'd rather not have the full control or the be in, uh, have the, um, uh, to have to make all the decisions as well. So maybe the Jupiter adding that in that sense, um, it, it might even say that this relationship was more about exploring feelings rather than intimacy the other part of the chart says with mars in sagittarius square neptune uh there's going to be a dissipation of sexual energy soonish the aspect is four degrees apart so sometimes i would read that as four weeks or four months but certainly mars neptune um can be difficult to pin down and it can be difficult to commit in a way that Saturn needs. So having a Mars Neptune might be a hugely creative endeavor with artistic endeavors, being interested in the same music, going dancing, um, alcohol, whatever it may be. Um, but the, the square, again, doesn't promise anything good or bad. It just says there's a challenge here about um, the energy and the level of commitment or, versus the level of non-commitment, disappearance, elusiveness. I've seen relationships over the years with this combination in the first meeting chart where somebody will disappear for three or four days and it will drive the other person mad or they'll end up looking obsessed or, you know, and it's not what they want to be. Uh, but the Neptune can have a way of just saying, actually, I, I don't want to be pinned down. I don't want to be... Um, uh, I don't want to be caught uh, yet. Uh, so that may be an issue. So I tend to look at the conjunctions, the squares and the oppositions, anything on the four angles. Uh, and of course, the inner planets to understand the different energies. So there's a lot there in this in this first meeting chart. And I imagine with that Jupiter in Pisces, it meant a lot to you that he came in order to help you with your dog, in order to help you with somebody you loved. And you probably remained loyal to that faithfulness in that sense of what he's prepared to do. Yeah, does that make some That's sense? Right, to you, and since then, actually, whenever I travel, this is the person who looks after my dogs and my dogs love him to bits. So, uh, and this time around, I'm going to go to Thailand and he's the one who is traveling with me to be able to get the dogs travel on board rather than at the bottom of the plane. Uh, do you tend to use the Horari principles in the meeting chart? What I mean by that is that if we look at, you know, the ascendant being one party and the descendant the other, then actually uh, Jupiter puts Mercury down into detriment and which is not so promising in a relationship department. So in case someone doesn't know, then you just go on the Jupiterian line because there's the ruler of the yeah. seventh. And Jupiter needs to like Mercury by rulership, exaltation, triplicity, or term phase, but those are the small dignities, uh, to kind of see a little bit of a connection. But if it puts it into detriment or fall, that in traditional Horarius logic, it's not a good sign in relationship 
department. So do you look at those in meeting charts? I I don't I don't I'm interested in those they're always interesting when when I see that um table um for me I would simply look at mercury in aquarius and realize that signs that are next door to each other like mercury in aquarius and jupiter in pisces they're of very different nature and um I find perhaps the most difficult uh challenges in relationships come from the signs next door the ones that we tend to be most um, intrigued by are the ones five signs away. So not opposite, but the ones either side of the opposite. So in this case, with Virgo ascendant, it would be Aries and Aquarius, uh, that quincunx, we call it, you know. So, um, but signs next door, I would look at you with your Mercury and Aquarius here, perhaps if that rules you, as being um, you know, focused on the work, focused on what you want to do with your community and your group. And the Jupiter in Pisces, uh, you know, you wanted clarity when you asked, what are you doing in the next five years? And Jupiter in Pisces might say, I don't know, wherever life takes me, or um, I'll just be hanging out, or maybe I'll just be on a beach somewhere, um, smoking a joint. I don't know. But it's very different from the clarity of Mercury in, a, in Aquarius that says, you know, I'm here to do something. It's a social responsibility in a way with Mercury in Aquarius. Jupiter in Pisces, if that represents him, and it probably sounds like it does, is more like, hey, let's just chill and see where life where life ends up. I've got no big, no big plans, no big ideas, you know? Um, so that initial question that you asked, which feels like a, it's a heavy question to ask, isn't it? Because it's an expectation. It's got a Saturn feeling to it. Go on, prove to me that you're worthy of my investment, you know? And his, his answer, whatever it was, um, obviously, didn't pass the test <laughs> so um but it maybe maybe that's the pisces speaking to the aquarius very very different energy yeah how did how did that feel for you absolutely you know what's interesting is that and this is i think where sometimes the meeting chart is more important than the synastry because i did of course before we met i looked at the synastry and you know we are talking about a person who has got uh, a stellium in actually identical chart, almost. So I am Pisces rising sign. The other party is Pisces rising sign. I have got Venus and Mars conjunction on the rising sign. The person has got Venus and Mars conjunction on the rising sign too. Aquarius sun. So we are just two days apart. Uh, the only difference is I have got stellium in Sagittarius and the other party has got the stellium in Aquarius. But the house position of those stelliums are the same as well. So the 10th house, uh, sorry, uh, mine is 10th, uh, his is 11th. Um, and when I saw the Capricorn uh, stellium, I was so happy about it. I was like, you know, somebody who is going to thrive for success and just like me. And then I got this answer of, well, I don't know, let's see, you know. Um, you know, wherever life takes me, the way how you described, and I got very disappointed about it. That <laughs> that's not the answer I was waiting for from a Capricorn stallion person. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You got a bit of a Pisces answer with Pisces rising, but your Pisces is obviously different. And um, you know, I it, it's interesting. I I think that it's obviously our choice if we want to engage, if we want to spend our time with somebody else. And we we hope that it's our, we're making a conscious decision to do that. You know, is this something that I feel alive and happy doing? Does this bring me joy? Do I bring the other person joy? These are all things that are going to be important. But I would also argue being a Gemini rising and being always thinking about the other hand and the other option, I would say perhaps his answer was precisely what you needed. And maybe other things didn't work and things didn't click together. But his idea might be saying to you, there is, you know, there's more to life than striving. Uh, you know, if you've got Mars in the first, like you have, life is about doing. And then we meet people who are about being instead of doing. And that's always tough for Mars people like you and me. You know, I'm Mars on the midheaven with Jupiter and I'm just doing, you know, I'm always doing. And I meet people who are very happy just being. And it's such a change of pace and it's tough. 
uh, but I feel that they're here to teach us something about the fact that everything we strive for in this world, at the end of the day, we need loved ones, we need people that care for us, we need, we can't take it with us to the next life. Um, nobody, unless we do work that we love, nobody sits on their deathbed wishing they'd spent more time at work. Um, it's it's So I think every relationship, if we're open to understanding it, will teach us something. Uh, but of course, it's more than just that. Obviously, it's a number of other things that that um, uh, that accumulated in your uh, three to four month relationship. But I, I think, yeah, there's always an invitation to do something very differently. And if you're both Mars, Venus rising, are you in Pisces? Is that right? You both got that. Pisces, yes. 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 It's, it's probably you are playing Mars and uh, he's playing Venus. And that happens yeah. everywhere you go, everywhere you go. I'm always meeting Venus people in my life. And when I meet Mars people, um, do I need another Mars? Maybe not, but maybe may, maybe I need, need a Venus sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, so um, from a horary point of view, you know, also I found it very, because I, did, I didn't look at this uh, chart back in the days. I just prepared this one for, um, the, for this lecture, but I did remember the timing. And now looking at it a little bit uh, on a deeper level, I can also see that obviously Moon is on, very late degrees and you said that um that moon is very important for you in the in the meeting chart so in horari uh, one of the principle would be if the planet is not making any more aspect and making sign change then probably the circumstances of the relationship would change now we did i did break up with this person after three months and obviously this moon change sign after three and three months and uh one and a half week time just like that and that's exactly when the breakup actually happens yeah so do you yeah. look at these uh nuances oh yes always um the the chart for any moment in time we can progress it we can direct it we can look at it in real time there are lots of ways of doing it but certainly that void moon um tells me that what you were perhaps planning or hoping for may not turn out to be what you were expecting. Um, often void moons, we take that literal translation of nothing will come at the matter, but a lot came of it. And in fact, you've got a dog sitter that you that you trust <laughs> and your dog, your dog's love, um, but it perhaps wasn't everything that you were planning it to be uh, in terms of looking at your sinistry. So the, the void moon doesn't deny in, um, but it's often in an ironic way, if we think we've got it all worked out, the void moon comes along and says, actually, we're going in that direction instead. So that's my feeling with it. So I would look at that and think, oh, it's not that he won't turn up or nothing will come with the relationship. It would just go perhaps in a different direction. And being a moon in Aquarius, it's the direction of friendship. In the sixth house, he's a friend to your pets. <laughs> he's he's the one that cares for them um, in that way. So, and maybe you offer him some sort of moon in Aquarius. Maybe you offer him a a gentle guide with his chart or something else. Do you offer that moon? It feels like he does that with the dogs. But what about you? Have you do you do that as a friend? Yeah, we do. We are very compatible as a friend, just not as lovers. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And uh, what about the sun? So do you look at the sun as the sole mission of the relationship or yes. as in the final destination of the relationship? Or how do you interpret that? Yes, it could be those things. Um, I don't know about final destination. Usually if relationships last, the final destination is death. You know, that's one of them. Um, I'll tell you something. I um, The reason I got interested in the first meeting chart is that my mum knew the moment that she met my dad. And so I thought, well, that's a chart in itself. And she remembers because they both arranged through friends to meet each other at a particular time. And she being a good Saturn rising, she was 10 minutes early. And so she always knows the exact time they met. And when I studied that chart over the years, you if you ever use asteroids um, named like PM, uh, personal named asteroids, 
um, the names are everywhere. Like my name, Frank, is on uh, Saturn, the Saturn in the chart, or uh, my sister's name is also on one of the planets. All sorts of fun you can have with the with the personally named asteroid. But that chart was activated in every major uh, situation in their lives for the 30 years that they were married until my dad died. And when he died, it was activated very strongly and it's still active. He's been dead now 20 years. And that chart is still the chart of their relationship. And when my mom passes away, the chart will probably be activated uh, because it's still charts live on as we know. And the, the amazing thing about a relationship chart, a uh, first meeting chart, is that uh, the angles and the degrees of the planet will show up in whatever you produce in that relationship. So, for example, if the two of you decided to put on a, um, uh, a conference or write a book together, this chart would be activated at the time of the launch or, or whatever it may be. Um, if you had a pet together, the pet's horoscope now my um, would be there. My mom and dad, um, they had one pet in 30 years. And in their first meeting chart, the moon is in Leo. And the cat that they had, we looked at her birth details uh, when she was born. And she was a Leo at the same degree as the moon of my parents' first meeting chart. And she was the center of the family. This cat was this beautiful Persian cat that looked like something out of an advert, you know? Um, so the chart is amazing, but the sun is the core. To come back to your question, it's like it can indicate the main purpose of the union, the main energy, the main focus of that. And it can also obviously indicate uh, opportunities and difficulties as well. Um, in the chart here, the sun is in 15, at 15 Capricorn. It's in the middle of Capricorn. And what I found is that the mid signs, the mid degrees of the signs are often a very powerful place to be. And the mid degrees of the cardinal signs, that's Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn. So if you're born sort of 15 days, perhaps, with your sun sign into um, into the sign. So around the 5th of January, as you've got here, or the 5th of April, around that time, 5th of October, uh, 5th of uh, July would be roughly then, um, the sun will be at the middle of that cardinal sign. And that's often a hotbed of some sort of activity, conflict, um, combat, some change, you know. So that sun in Capricorn in the fifteenth, it could at fifteen degrees, could be conflict to do with work goals, long term plans. Very Capricorn. So when you see mid degrees, it means um, it depends on the the mode. But with the cardinal planets, it's often a, a place of conflict or where a lot of action takes place because of that. Uh, so I find that very interesting that you met at a very cardinal point as well. Um, interesting that you mentioned all the, um, you know, possibly we can do progressions and solar arc and all those type of things yeah. with this chart as well. <laughs> Because if I look at it, that Saturn is actually transiting the moon now. So initially we met because of my pets. Now Saturn is sitting on the moon and I have got trouble of booking ticket to Thailand because uh, there are two dogs and uh, there can be only two dogs um, in the cabin. And if there is no space, then they have to go at the bottom of the plane. And I spent the whole day today trying to book a ticket uh, from the 2nd till the 9th of March, any day, any time, just please. And there is no space for dogs at all, neither at the bottom nor on the top. So Saturn is transiting the moon there uh, currently. So a little bit of a blockage in regards to pets and animals. Yes, yes. What an amazing symbolism of that. And also what I find Saturn does, it sometimes, it doesn't say no, but it just says not yet. Saturn is great for saying, go further, you'll get a better deal. For example, I've just moved house and I'm still unloading all my books <laughs> behind me. And um, 
we we looked at a couple of houses before and each time the first two houses somebody got there first because it's crazy you know sometimes the housing market is like everybody rushly you know madly rushes and rushes into everything so and we looked at a uh one of the houses and we thought we'd missed the perfect house and then when we found this one just a few months ago we're actually somewhere far better than we were going to be in every sense and it feels very saturnian um my feeling if i'm going to make a prediction uh which i don't really do but um in uh, we know that saturn moves into pisces in um in march we know very early march i'm just looking at my ephemeris it moves on the 7th march 7th of march but it doesn't get to that descendant degree and that jupiter until about the 20th 21st so it might be that you end up deciding to book for a week later or there's a there's a situation in your relationship while you're away in the middle of march but saturn will get to one degree which will be hitting that jupiter and the descendant degree which of course is one degree as well um so it looks like there's a major um uh, a major turning point it might just simply be the travel and getting that sorted or it might be that um you, know, you have some major discussions um in that first week of being there uh while you're while you're doing your trip um but you know saturn comes along and sometimes the lessons it offers us all planets offer us lessons i think but saturn is the tough one it's the one that we would ah oh, do we have to do it and but we know we should do it in order to grow in order to feel like we're mastering life uh, so it's one of those shoulds rather than would or could <laughs> so it might be that it you decide to travel just a little bit later uh but we'll have to see we'll have to see how that works out depends on how your mars goes into gear when you start trying to book uh new flights if you can later today <laughs> uh, well i already have got some plans i just need to get it activated um so we looked at the sun the ascendant and the sun um do you look at anything else i mean what i usually do is uh i do look at uh the fifth and the eleventh houses as well but maybe because uh, i am an intimate person so uh from the department i think it should play out pretty well too so do you uh, go deeper in those as well which is again a primary relationship house really on one hand Yes, I I think the fifth house is it's interesting how over the years psychologically the eighth house has become about sex when in fact the fifth house I guess I when people say to me isn't you know traditionalism sometimes modern astrology will argue about the difference between those two houses and I think it depends on the sex you have if we're being really honest you know the fifth house is playful joyful creative the eighth house is um the level of intimacy that goes into trust issues it goes into deeper levels so um i would put my foot in both one foot in each house uh because i think both of them are important the fifth and the eighth the seventh um is open it's like the first and the seventh we see that a lot it's the fifth and the eighth if uh, in terms of intimacy that takes time to see whether you can jump from the 5th into the 8th and back again it's almost like you need a bit of both you need to jump in both of those uh what's your feeling I completely agree um uh, i um i had an interview recently about the differences between the 5th and the 8th house oh. and one of the ways how i describe is that the 5th house is something to do with puppy love and that's the initial chemistry between two people such as how the let's say the sex is going to play out at the beginning but the bigger lesson is uh once you know the honeymoon period kind of finished and how the intimacy department plays out then and chronologically speaking you know first we're going to be dating with people before we get married so especially nowadays you know we are not waiting to get married and then have the first sexual intercourse uh most of the times it happens before so there's the fifth house really and one of the primary focus of 
people having sexual intercourse is the procreation eventually, which is again a fifth house meta, as in children. So I tend to associate the sex with fifth house. And just like you said, I put my foot into the eighth house as well often um, because um because that might be something what happens after marriage or 20 years later you know is it still alive or but eighth house is not as sexual for me uh because sex shouldn't be a trauma and the primary meaning of the eighth house often is about trauma however and when i look at the taurus yes. and scorpio axis and Scorpio is about, you know, releasing the trauma and sex is about releasing some tension from the body, then I kind of understand the moder modern intake on that too. And also it's about penetration as well and how much you trust the person to, to do all that type of thing because it takes an enormous amount of energy to open up for someone. So I get the modern vibe of the eighth house, why it connects to intimacy, but primarily I focus on the fifth house myself. Yeah. And if we think about the second and the eighth anyway, and the rulers, Venus and Mars, naturally, um, we're looking at the big source of joy and conflict in relationships. And we know that couples tend to argue mostly about money and sex. They're the big thing. So um, you know, they speak very strongly of Taurus and Scorpio and possibly the second and the eighth. But it's interesting because I think the eighth is about, um, you know, it's the orgasm is known as the little death, of course, and uh, in, in French. And the eighth house has that, if I let go, if I trust, if I, if I can um, go with the flow, I'm actually afraid i'm i'm a, uh, i'm uh there's a great fear of loss associated with scorpio and with the eighth house uh and so that's it's like we can have great sex but eighth house is when you really see the vulnerability of somebody when they open up about their childhood and i must say uh, i've never met anybody who hasn't had some sort of trauma that they carry we all have a wound we all have uh, Chiron, we all have 8th house stuff, we have 12th house stuff, we have stuff carried in from generations, even if we didn't, we don't even know how to articulate it. And so all of these things, I think, come up with the water houses, 4, 8, and 12, but particularly the 8th when it comes to relationships. Um, so it's amazing what you don't know you suffered, or don't know what you've been through until you trust and open up to somebody. And you you become vulnerable, and you you allow that feeling that you could lose, you could lose yourself, you could lose them, and so maybe the eighth house has a lot to do with that uh, that trust once we've relinquished power in some way. Yeah, that's why I always say to people: if you have any planet in the eighth house, you need to share that on a bigger level rather than keeping it yourself, keeping it to yourself, because the eighth house is about sharing as well. However, I tend to look at the eighth house, to be frank, more about accumulated karma in this incarnation, if we really want to be karmic, meaning that karma for me is kind of like a straw system. And then when I get married to someone, then an additional straw is added to the existing system already. And then a new flow of energy is coming in. So... And then I tend to be looking at the 12th house more about the ancestry karma, as well as uh, the karma which is gained from uh, the mummy's womb, basically, because for me, the 12th house is the last month of the pregnancy. And the 4th house is the family karma, the immediate family karma. Yeah, but, you know, again, I guess it's just a personal approach. Interesting, very interesting. Anything yeah. else you think is important um, to mention about well, meeting charts? Just that I would look at the other points in the chart. I'd look for uh, both the moon and Mercury in terms of communication. I think Mercury is how we assimilate what we're feeling and how we try to translate it into something that that becomes a word or becomes a, an idea. But the moon is the, the planet of communication in, in absorbing absorbing information, absorbing 
how you feel about something. And the Mercury then takes it up into the left brain and tries to do something with it. But the moon is very right brain. Uh, so I'd look at both of those to see communication, uh, to see which may be dominant in a chart, for instance. Um, I'd look at the midheaven, of course. I'm a big fan of looking at the MC up there to show shared goals, uh, the mission of, of the... Um, of the partnership, et cetera. So, and anything on the angles is going to become immediately more important, immediately uh, uh, dominant in the chart. Yeah, so, but it's, I'd read it as any other, any natal chart, except it's an energy of, of two people. It's a moment of time that could have fizzled out in 20 minutes, or it could go and last for a lifetime and beyond. So we don't know that, but it's still a quality that we can try to interpret, which I find uh, endlessly fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think um, everyone will be able to take something away from this uh, mini lecture because I think it was fascinating. And I recommend uh, to everyone to look at um, their meeting chart, especially if you know the timing of that but it might reveal loads of great stuff for you. So currently you started teaching Horari or you will be teaching Horari soon? Well, I'm teaching it this weekend, funnily enough. Uh, we're doing a double day, a uh, double, um, two days of sessions were recorded so people can watch it later, but it's um, going to be working with student examples. But as you know, um, Horari, which is the art of uh, you know, answering questions using astrology or election astrology, where you you plan the best time for an endeavor. These are uh, you know, original ancient uses of astrology. These are things that we that go back thousands and thousands of years. And there's a lot of insight, a lot of um, approaches to things. And sometimes it's overwhelming. And my attitude is if you can get confident at the beginning and not feel overwhelmed with too much and just start to ease yourself in, you'll get confidence. And confidence is an amazing thing when you're learning. If you feel like you're getting it and you're, you're noticing stuff, you're observing things, you start to run instead of walk. And so the the journey I try to do at the at the school yeah, and um, oh, the, the journey I, I try at the school is, is, is to really help people build the confidence. Otherwise, uh, it can the whole subject is huge and it can feel overwhelming so uh, that's what we're trying to do this weekend with the horror but uh, there's always something else i'm teaching and i love teaching this subject as well because it's great fun always insightful people's stories never cease to fascinate me and to also to articulate astrology in ways that i haven't even thought of sometimes so you're one today about the pet and the the guardianship of that um uh, that wouldn't have been the first thing on my mind when i was looking at it so um uh, great uh, great to have another example of astrology in action yeah you know even interesting to see um series very tightly on the midheaven as well now i do use the four major asteroids and series is about nurturing and caring too so clearly, if uh, the planetary bodies are important on the angle, then Sirius gets a huge emphasis here. Yeah. So sure, definitely very interesting chart. Yeah. Well, if you guys are interested in uh, Frank's teaching, then uh, I will put his uh, website details um, in the comment box below. So check it out. I did uh, study bits and bobs with Frank, and I think he's a great teacher so I definitely recommend him. Thank you. And I hope Thank you enjoyed you. Your, your week. Uh, how long are you going to be teaching relationship astrology for? Is it a week? It's going to be five days and one day family constellation. So yes, it's going to be uh, no uh, five days, not even enough, actually. But uh, I had to just be mindful about the timing. My strong Sagittarius, once I start talking, I cannot stop. Uh, and then I just share information all the time. So I think my longest webinar so far was seven and a half hours. Yes. Now I learned to, con I mean, I learned to minimize that to two and a half hours. That's the longest I take on now. But, but yeah, it used to be seven hours as well. And I can see that people cannot take that much information. So I had to learn the hard way. 
<laughs> they can always come well, back. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It's all right. Two and a half hours is very good for me now. Well, well thank, you. thank you very much for joining me on this fascinating talk. I hope everyone have enjoyed it. And I hope to see you maybe another time with another topic. Thanks, Victor. It's been lovely. And I hope everyone gets on well and, in, and researches their own chart as well if they can. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And see you with the next video. Bye-bye. Yeah.